Ken. And let's put our hand together and welcome our prophet, Robert Navari. And, and the beautiful wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hallelujah. The Hi, Lord. Yeah, man. Hallelujah. Oh, blessing. Yes. Blessing. Praise yeah. God. Yeah, you look awesome. I like Jerusalem in the back. The backdrop. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, the backdrop is wonderful. I love that backdrop. Thank you. I feel yeah. like I'm, I'm at home in Yerushalayim. Ah, uh -huh, that's right. Yeah, yes. wonderful. Well, are you ready for me or are you going to yes, pray? Yes, we are all waiting. We are all ready. For the prophet. You already pray? Yeah. No, we are waiting for you to pray okay. for us. <laughs> Okay, I'll pray. Thank you. Gracious, loving Father, thank you so much for this wonderful time to share, to give glory and honor to your holy name. Amen. Because all that I have seen, all that I've experienced, places I've gone, it's all been by your grace. Amen. You have led me to this moment. Now, Father, I want to give glory and honor and praise to your holy name. Thank you for those who are watching. I pray a special blessing upon them right now. Thank you. They will be inspired. They will be strengthened. They will be built up. That the Lord himself will make himself known to them in a very special way. Amen. We thank you, Father, for just... Uh, J.O. and Christina just arranging all this, Father, for us to, to be together, to visit. There is no distance because we're in your presence, in the Holy of Holies. So, Father, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God, God is so good. I, um, I have to say, first of all, this is the day the Lord has made. Amen. Let us rejoice and be glad in it Amen. and give him the praise and give him the honor. And I and my precious wife feel very blessed. I said to her, please say hello to the people. I won't keep you so that when I talk about my wife, they will be able to say, yeah, we just saw her. It's real. <laughs> oh, so good to see you, Janet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You two look so young. My goodness, what are you doing over there? Uh, my wife. <laughs> she fit me well. <laughs> she fit me well, and she stirred me up all the time and keep me alert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever you're feeding uh, your husband, send it to Janet. <laughs> Janet to give it to me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, I know you want me to share my life story. Amen. My life story began with uh, John G. Lack, an anointed man of God from America. Uh, he walked with God in an unusual way. When he went to South Africa, he met my father in the Hilton Hotel, downtown Johannesburg. And the moment he walked into the hotel, demons started screaming, people started falling over. He was just checking in. And many miracles happened before he checked in. And my father went to, he was working in the kitchen. He ran up to the front and said, who is this man? Is this Jesus? This is the stuff that I read in the Bible, but I've never seen. It's all in the Bible. The Bible is full of miracles. It's a miracle filled book of the supernatural, of the miraculous, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, the New Testament, the Acts of the Apostles, all about miracles, signs, and wonders. And for the first time, he ran into a man who walked in those miracles. Amen. And that was a defining moment for him. That is what changed his life. That was the moment that, that he met him. He said, I want you to come to Rhodesia. That is where I was born, southern Rhodesia in those days, Zimbabwe today. Those were the 
60 years ago, over nearly 70 years ago, actually. And um, it was an important invitation to invite this man to come to Rhodesia. And he said, I cannot come to Rhodesia, but uh, I'll, I'll send some missionaries. If you, they'll come here to this hotel and you take them to your country, they'll be able to study work to help your people to know God the way you've just seen the miracles, the signs, the wonders. They'll be able to do these signs and wonders for your people. So my father waited and waited and waited and waited. Suddenly, one day, there were 10 missionaries sent by John Gillac. He says, we come to go with you to Rhodesia. So they brought the missionaries and started what is called now Rufaro Mission. Rufaro Mission, the word Rufaro was the name that my father called it because the missionary Willard Wilson from Miami said to him, what is the word for rejoicing? My father said, Rufaro, jubilation, wow. a place of jubilation, a place of meeting with God. That's why it was called Rufaro Mission. And Rufaro Mission today has got 2.5 million people. Wow. <laughs> wow. It has changed the whole country. Uh, you know, the revival, the paragon continues. It's it's the real fire, not strange fire. The fire God can burn forever and ever and ever and ever. And that fire is continues to burn and it's transforming the whole nation and has gone to other nations. Now it's from um, all over Sub-Saharan Africa. It's right up to, to North Africa. It's spreading and exploding across the whole continent. And I thank God for my father meeting a man called John G. Lack. If some of you have not heard of him, there are books about him. Books I encourage every Christian to read because they are powerful books. They are books that bring encouragement Amen. and uh, bring strength to the church of Jesus Christ. So I really encourage those who want to go all the way with Jesus to say, this is a book that to show you how to walk in the supernatural when he was in South Africa, he led 1,000 churches to the Lord wow. and to the baptism of the Holy Spirit in wow. one year. And he led the prime minister of South Africa to the Lord. In that one year, he changed the country forever. That is revival. That is the power of God. And these missionaries that came my mother was pregnant with me and they prophesied in a meeting where all the people were listening and the prophecy was, you are carrying a male baby and you shall call him Robert. For God has called him to prepare his people for the end of time. He shall go to the nations and he shall prepare the nations for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. That's how I got the name Robert. And of course, that was an impartation, a prophetic impartation that has defined my life. That is why I'm speaking right now. That's why I share. That's why I, I go to nations speaking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is something that I was given before I was born. And since that time, I can only say that God has done amazing, wonderful, glorious miracles. My life has been amazed at the power of the Holy Spirit, at the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, just to share a few things, because I can't share everything. Those who want to know the details, <laughs> you can go to my, my Facebook or YouTube, Dr. Robert Mawiri, Man of God, and there you get all the details of uh, everything because it will be all night, all day sharing. <laughs> so I'm just going to share the highlights for those who are listening who are saying, hey, who is this Dr. Robert Mawiri? Because everywhere I go, people say, who is Dr. Robert Mawiri? Who is he? I mean, 
I'm a man called by God. Amen. I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness of nations. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And uh, I'm not with the, with, with, with the great and the mighty. I'm just with the mighty God. And I just Amen. go where he sends me, do what he, he tells me, because he is my all in all. He is my, he is my, 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 my strength. He is my joy. He is my peace. He is my everything. He is my provider. I mean, everything I have. And so I will share a little bit about um, when, when I was growing up, the teacher would say <laughs> to the kids, what are you going to do when you grow up in life? You know, what do you want to be in your life? And the kids will stand up and say, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be this and I want to be this. Then I'll stand up and say, I'm going to be a preacher. And every kid would just laugh and cry out with laughter that he's a struggling nothing. And you talk to women and children and be a struggling nothing. So I, I realized God had not assigned, had not given me anything to be excited about that I've been cursed before I was born to be a struggling nothing. So I, I decided I will turn away, I'll go my own way and be what I want to be, not what God wants me to be. Uh -huh. So I turned away from um, following God's vision to doing my own thing. And so I say to the Lord, okay, just in case what, the, that, what those missionaries said is true, that you're calling me to the nations to do these things. If it's true, I'm going, giving you one last chance. And I said, I'm going to write it down. God, if you do not send a man to me from another country, because people in this country know the story. So I don't want to hear anybody in this country. I want somebody from another country who has never been to this country, knows nothing about Robert Mawire, to come up to me and say, your name is Robert Mawire, and the missionary said this before you were born. If that happens, I will go anywhere you sent me. Otherwise, on the day of judgment, I'm writing it down. This will be my witness that if you had done it, I would have gone. Because you didn't send anybody, I'm, I'm free from this word. Because I don't know whether it was just them talking, uh, you know, prophesying out of their own juices, as we say, or it was God. So when I did that, in three weeks' time, a man called Henry Putgita came to the city, a Dutchman, and he was having a crusade. So I went to the crusade, hundreds of people, thousands really of people, gathered together in a, in a, in a, in a soccer field. And when I went there, the man stopped. He says, thank you, God. The man you want me to speak to is right here. And over the speakers to thousands of people, he started calling my name. Robert Mawiri, come up here. Robert Mawiri, come up here. And when I went up there, he said, you the man who said to God, if you don't send a man to tell me what those missionaries say, you won't go, you won't do what he said. He has sent me to tell you that those missionaries were, were speaking the word of the Lord, and he has sent me to confirm their prophecy as you requested from the Lord. And hundreds of people were listening. And, uh, and he said, you shall heal the sick, you shall cast out devils, you shall raise the dead, and you shall go to the nations. And um, <laughs> my brother, Kingston, he was so excited. And so he went ahead and prepared <laughs> the first crusade, healing crusade. He published uh, the, the, the crusade. He sent flyers everywhere, invited the whole city. My brother is going to heal the sick. And he, after that, he comes and tells me, say, Robert, I got everything ready. I said, what is that? You're going to be preaching at this convention center? And you are going to heal the sick and cast out devils, just like Henry Potkita said. I said, wait a minute. I don't have the power. I don't feel the power. I could not feel the power that now this hand of God is upon me. Then I'll go do those things. Right now, I'm too ordinary. I don't have uh, something special. Uh, I don't feel special. I um, feel so ordinary. God's hand is not yet upon me. The time is not yet. My brother said, look, God said it. 
That's all you need. You're going to do it. So that night, the place was packed out. And the honest truth is I ran away. I said, I can't do this. I've never preached in my life. What are you doing? And the people were singing and everything was, was a great meeting. So I went back to the house. And my brother comes and says, Robert, people are singing. They're waiting. You've got to come. You've got to speak. God said, you are the man. And you've got to do what God said. I said, Kingston, I don't have the power. I don't know what to do. He said, you got, you've got to believe that God will be with you and stand with you and speak through you. And it was true. I went back. I spoke. And that night, I saw my first miracle. A woman with leprosy. The eyes were all, all eaten out with leprosy. The lips were all eaten out with leprosy. And that night, as I prayed, she was completely healed. New eyes, new fingers, new lips, brand new woman. She was jumping up and down, and the whole place went wild. I went wild. I'm like, wow, God, you can do miracles. I, I didn't even believe he was going to do it. I didn't have the faith. If I had a way to run out, I would have just literally physically just run out of the building because I didn't feel like I had the anointing. It was the faith of these people that brought the miracle. And it was a miracle that changed me. It was more for me than that lady because for the, I couldn't sleep thinking, wow, God, you can actually do this. It's like, this, this is amazing. So I was so amazed that literally I couldn't sleep with the joy of knowing that God is actually real, that real miracles can happen to real people. So that was a turning point in my life. When I saw that miracle, I knew then, okay, he's a miracle working God. You can believe for any miracle and he will answer you. Amen. Because he says, ask and it shall be given. Amen. Knock and the door will be opened. And these signs will follow them that believe. Since then, I've seen the dead raised. Wow. Um, that very week, a, 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 little, a little girl died. And, the, you know, back in Africa, <laughs> they don't have cars. They, go, they travel by bus. And they put the little girl in, in a container, in a big box, and, took a, and put it with the, with the luggage in the bus. Wow. And went from one station to another until they got to my house. And they walked in and they were carrying this, 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 this big luggage. I didn't know what it was. And they opened it in front of me and said, you said last night that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he healed, he raised the dead, he opened the blind eyes, and our little girl died. And we brought him for you to raise him up. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I, I, I've never gone this way. I've never seen this way before. And <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> it's okay when you're preaching. It's another thing when you're confronted with a situation. Amen, amen. So I'm like, okay. The amazing thing is I'm trying to get out. I'm trying to, 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 to climb through the window and run out uh, through the, the, the bedroom because I can't, I can't handle this because I know I'm going to pray and she's not going to be raised. And it's gonna be big, big problem in the in the city. My name and everything, and the security and the you know dead body. And, oh wow, this is crazy. My brother said, Robert, do you remember the, the other night what happened? God has anointed you to do this. Pray for that girl, and God will raise her up. And I did, and she sat up in that big box. Wow. <laughs> she was totally raised from the dead. They took her out. I thought they would jump up and down and be so uh, screaming. They just assumed that's what God was going to do. No big deal. And I'm like, no big deal. <laughs> this, is, this is big. He says, you said God said it. So why shouldn't he do it? He said it. And he called you to do this. You know, this is one of the things that my missionary I sent to Africa was when I was, was amazed. These miracles would happen and the Africans would just walk away from, this, from, from the stage, completely healed, not screaming up and down. And she came to me and says, what's wrong with these people? When a miracle of this magnitude happened, 
we get excited. I said, well, they just assume it's going to happen. <laughs> Their faith is so strong that it's, it, if it doesn't happen, they'll get excited because they think there's something wrong with you because God's not confirming your word. I said, that's the only time they won't get excited because when you see miracles, it somehow it raises your level of faith and expectation. You begin to expect more and more and more. Because since that day, I've expected more and more. Here in America, the, the Lord raised um, a little boy. After eight hours, the doctor writing the death, the death certificate. And um, they called me to go there. And the doctor walked in and says, we just uh, writing the death certificate and we, you can wait for your husband because he was flying in from California. And when he comes, then we take the little boy to the mortuary. And while he said that, the spirit of the Lord came upon me. He said, this is for my glory. This is for my glory. I said, Lord, what do you want? He says, I want you to raise him up in this city where they've never seen miracles of this magnitude. And he will go home in 72 hours. Wow. So I turned to Leslie, the mother, I said, don't worry. Your little boy that's dead, God's going to raise him up. You will take him home in eight hours, in 72 hours. And uh, she's like, well, the doctor is writing a death certificate. It's over with us. It's not over until God says that it's over. God just spoke to me that he, this little boy is going to leave and not die. You come back, you'll be restored. And so I left and she says, are you leaving? I said, yes, God has already done it. And the boy was still dead. <laughs> and so they, in the wedding room, people say, how is it? I said, it's great. And they're like, the doctor just came and told everybody the boy is dead eight hours ago. I said, what? I said, no problem. You go home in 72 hours. It's, it's fine. And that, you're crazy. You know, they thought, oh, yeah, this African guy, he's crazy. He's crazy. Because the, the man is one of the, rich, one of the rich people. And so all the richest people were there. The, the who's who, the people you read in the newspaper, they were all there in the waiting room. And now I walk out and say something crazy. It's like, the boy will be raised, you'll be fine. Because God told me that I want a testimony among the super rich, that they may know that I'm God. People that no, nobody can, can preach to, reach out to. I have set this up so that my name may be glorified. Amen. So as a result, the husband came several hours later and this, the, boy, the, the, the little boy is still in the room because they're waiting for him to see his little boy the last time before they take him to the mortuary. So they are, he walks in, he hugs his wife and, and said, what did Robert say? He says, well, Robert says he's gonna leave, but it's like 10 hours now. <laughs> he's dead, he's very dead. He, no pulse, no blood, no nothing, he's dead. And, as, and he says, well, he's still dead. And the moment the husband was there, the little boy cried. <gasps> And wow. they turned around, the little boy was crying. And they picked the, the, the little boy, and this is the, the wisdom of God. Amen. When God raised him up, the doctor came with a big injection to put him back to sleep. Oh. And the husband, because the husband was there, he defended uh, his, his boy. He said, no, you're not going to do this to my boy. He says, well, we got a death certificate. We got to, he's dead. He's clinically dead. He says, no, I'm not going to let you do that. Because if God had raised him up before the husband, they would have put him back to sleep. So they said, okay, we're not going to inject him, but you're not taking him out of here for 72 hours. Wow. They kept them because they say you can't take a dead baby home. And they're like, my baby is normal. He's feeding, he's crying. He's just the normal, my normal baby. He's my normal a toddler. He's my, my normal toddler. They say, no, he's clinically dead. You can't leave. You can't, we can't let you take this baby out of this hospital because it's, it's clinically dead. 
Mm. So for 72 hours, they kept the boy. And after 72 hours, they said, now you can take him home, but we'll have to check him for six months to make sure that he is not brain dead. <laughs> so they checked him for six months and uh, Willie is now in the US Army. Normal guy, great guy, 100% healed, restored. And that story was on CBN News. It went everywhere, the whole city. It was actually God introducing me to the Dallas Fort Worth community of believers. Yes. That was how he introduced me so that they will know there is a man of God in town that God is sent. Praise so God. that was the, the, the humor of God. He was like, nobody knows you, but I will introduce you. And that's how he introduced me. And I can, I can share many other miracles that has happened because the most important thing for this night is to tell everyone that's listening to me that the word of God is true. These signs shall follow them that believe. Heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead. That is a promise for every believer, not a minister, every believer. If you believe the word, God will do what he says. Amen. God is not a mental lie. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. What's limiting the supernatural from being unleashed on the earth is our unbelief. Walking in doubt. Because if you doubt, you go without. If you believe, you receive. It's all about taking God at his word. Because if God said it, that's the way it's going to be. He stands behind his word to perform it. The supernatural is available to every person, Amen. anytime, anywhere. God is real. It is these supernatural miracles that bring the people. People get sick and they want to find a man of God that can pray for them. Yeah. People get in trouble and they want somebody who can help them because Christ is always in the crisis. Every problem is a prospect for a miracle. And I can honestly say, I've seen God turn every problem into a prospect of a miracle. God has been so good. I can share a lot more concerning the healing of the sick. That, that is something that not just special to me, that is for every believer. Even more so in these days, in the last days, Every believer must believe and receive the anointing because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. It is the anointing that heals the sick. It is the anointing that all the supernatural happens because God is with you. If God is with you, then he will confirm his word with signs following. So the issue is not, well, God doesn't want to do this. No, God wants to do it, but we are not willing to pay the price. We are not willing to lay down our lives and say, thy will be done. It took faith to say to Leslie, your boy will live when he's dead. And he's been dead for eight hours. And the doctor is writing a death certificate. It took a lot of faith to say, that says the Lord. He will leave. It doesn't matter what the doctor said, clinically dead. It takes us that faith to say, God, you are God. You said it. We believe it, and then we expect it, and it will always happen. God's not a man to lie. His promises are yea and amen in Christ amen. Jesus. Yea and amen. Yes, 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 yes in Christ Jesus. So this is a word of encouragement to all of us in these last days, that as we are moving into the times of these global pandemics, we need the supernatural. Amen. Miracles, when people get coronavirus, this COVID-19, they should call on the people of God and you should lay hands on them and say, go and be tested. And they'll test them. And they will say, no coronavirus, no coronavirus, no coronavirus. They test them first as positive. You pray for them, they're healed. You pray for them, they're healed. So the world will know that there is a God. He is with us. We are the people of God. We are chosen by him. He walks with us. He lives with us. He is in our lives. He is our life. We no longer live, but Christ lives in us. 
this life that we live, we live by the faith of the Son of God who died for us. He is our life. He is our all in all. And what the whole of the Asian countries are waiting for is the release of the supernatural in signs and wonders. Amen. This is why God has me sharing tonight to say there is no miracle too big for God. Amen. There is no miracle too big for God. Now, I'm going to leave the, 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 the supernatural in terms of the healing and move into the, into the area of um, how God has shown me that he is a provider, Jehovah Jireh. Because sometimes we're not sick. We just need finances. It's just like, oh, God, we, 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 we need finances. Can you meet my financial needs? Can you come through for me on that? Well, my God is El Shaddai, Amen. the God of too much. And we can believe him for the too much. The Lord spoke to me. He said, you shall go to Australia. That's where you're going to meet your wife. Yes. And uh, going to Australia would have costed me two lifetimes <laughs> of salary to get the airfare. Yes. Because when, we, when you go preach in Africa, they give you pennies. If you make a dollar, that's big. So there is no way <laughs> that I could have made it to Australia, but God says, uh, I want you to go to Australia. You will meet your wife in Australia. And uh, I say, God, you know, I can't afford it. I don't know anybody in Australia. I don't have the money to go to Australia. And number two, no passport. I don't have the, the right passport to leave this country. Because in those days, some of you, like, you know, uh, Joe and the Christina there, you understand what I'm talking about. In those days, there was a man called Ian Smith. He had made a unilateral declaration of independence and declared Rhodesia, because Singapore is part of the Commonwealth. So you, you understand these people from the Commonwealth. They, this makes sense. <laughs> so he had declared UDI, unilateral declaration of independence. And so our passport from Rhodesia was an illegal document issued by an illegal government, unacceptable to any country. So God says, you go to Australia. And I'm like, how do I go to Australia, a Commonwealth country? They won't accept my passport. So I'm not going to be translated and, and disappear at the immigration and suddenly be in the country. I'm like, you are God, but I, it doesn't make sense. Because in the normal natural world, People don't just disappear and appear in other countries. I said, how are you going to do this? That's number one. Number two, I have no money. I, if I can afford to get a bus to go downtown, that is much money that I can afford to fly half around the world. That's a miracle of biblical proportion. That's a big miracle. So there is not the problem of the passport. Number two, the problem of money. Number three, the problem of no contact in Australia. If I just show up in Australia, I don't know anybody. So where am I going to go? And the Lord said, I said, God, he said, I have an answer to all those things. This is the most amazing thing about our God. His will is built. When you receive the, the will of God, he has everything worked out, all the details worked out. The, 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 first, the, the, the first one was money. So I'm like, God, I need the money. And I need the contact. Then I need the passport. I said, look, God, you're so great. Great are you, Lord. I want you to send a man from Australia. I want him to come all the way to Rhodesia, to Salisbury. That, that's what you, it's all Harare or Salisbury in those days, some 45 years ago, uh, Salisbury. I said, you send a man here to Salisbury from Australia with money 
to, say, to, to pay my way back. So I will have a contract and I'll let them kick it. That's what I need from you. So in two weeks, Brian Lynette and his friend Charlie were going to India to visit their missionaries from Australia in India. And in those days, they had to stop over in Mauritius. And in Mauritius, this Baptist elder looked at his friend and says, Charlie, God's speaking to me. He says, what? He said, what is he saying? He said, I'm to go to Rhodesia. And he said, go to Rhodesia, they are killing all the whites. So why would God send you to a place where they're killing all the whites? Because that was during the revolution. And so the whites were being killed. It was true. He says, why would God send you to Rhodesia where they're killing whites? Do you know anybody in Rhodesia? He said, no. Do you have any plans for Rhodesia? He said, no. He says, all I am hearing is God telling me I must go to Rhodesia and change my flight. He said, but what about the missionaries that are waiting for us? They, you have your own preaching points where you're going, they're going to go with this other missionary to preach at this, this congregation and I'm going to be preaching with this other missionary and we made this arrangement for a whole year. <laughs> we planned everything. Mm -hmm. Now you can't tell me halfway to India, we just called the people before we left that we are on our way. How can you tell me halfway to India that you're going to change and go to Rhodesia where they're killing whites? What, what? just makes sense to me. I can't, if that makes sense. It can't be God. God. Okay, Brian, has God ever spoken to you before? He says, no. But I hear him right now. He is saying, I must go to Rhodesia. He says, well, did he tell you what you're going to do in Rhodesia? He says, I don't know. He just said to go to Rhodesia. <laughs> and his friend Charlie, whom I met, gets so mad at him because it was crazy. He's like, you, you're going crazy. So you're going to go there and what, you're probably going to be killed by those blacks. So he, 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 he got on the plane and flew to Salisbury. In those days, Harare was called Salisbury. So he flew to Salisbury and he checked into a hotel and he's standing in the hotel and says, God, what am I doing here? I don't know anybody. They, they, I can't go anywhere. I'm just in this room and maybe I was crazy when you said go to Rhodesia. Then he thought, well, maybe I need to get hold of Christians, some Christian organization. Maybe there's something God wants me to do. So he, came, he, tell, he took the yellow pages. If you know what the <laughs> yellow pages was a, a, a telephone directory. Mm -hmm. So he took the directory and opened it and he fell right there, Christian Businessman Fellowship. Uh -huh. As a businessman, he says, okay, mm -hmm. I'll call the Christian Businessman Fellowship. So he called, and Peter Lee was the, was the chairman. He said, who are you? He says, I'm Brian Lynette. I come from Australia. He says, what are you doing here? He says, I don't know. He says, oh, <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> so it, it, then what do you want? He says, well, I want to attend. If you have a meeting, I want to come to the meeting. He thought, mm, I don't know about these strange guys that show up with no appointment. He says, OK, Brian, what are you doing tonight? He says, nothing. I have nowhere to go. I'm just in this hotel. He says, well, tell you what. I'll come and pick you, pick you up, and you can have dinner with us tonight. Because he wanted to check him out. So <laughs> he went over and picked up Brian, and they're having dinner. He's a normal businessman, a mega businessman in Australia. And he's like, wow. So what happened? So well, I was going to India, and then God told me, I must come to Rhodesia. So did he tell you what you were coming to Rhodesia to do? He says, no. And when I was in the room, I asked God to lead me, and he led me to the, to, to the Christian Businessman Fellowship. So I'm here to come to the meeting. I don't know, maybe God will talk to me when I get there. So after the evening, they dropped me back at the hotel, and because he was jet-lagged, he kind of slept in. And when I got to the meeting, Mr. Peter Lee says to me, Robert, last night this strange guy from Australia, I picked him up from the hotel and um, each, when we were having dinner, something inside of me said, this man 
is sent by God for you. I said, wait a minute. Is he Aboriginal? He said, no, he's white. I said, well, white people come to see other white people. So why would they come to see me? He said, are you a racist? I said, no, I'm just a realist. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> that's how things work. He said, well, I don't know, but that's how I felt. If he comes, maybe you talk to him. Maybe there's something. And so I knew that there was another guy that is not local that was going to come to the meeting. And the Lord said to me, because that morning when I woke up going to the meeting, I said to my brother Kingston, Kingston, my time to go to Australia has come. It's going to happen very soon. I'm leaving. So we got the meeting and there's this man. So I realized, okay, this is the man from Australia that I asked God. But this is what I'm going to do. At the end of the meeting, I'm going to run out of this meeting. I'm not going to meet him, because if I try to meet him, I'm trying to conjure up something and trying to make it happen, try to help God out. I said, no, if you send by God, he will have to run after me and <laughs> grab me and say, I'm sent by God. If not, I'm not meeting the guy. So at the end of the meeting, we just finished, and here walks this strange guy, and I go through the, 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 the side door. I walk out fast through the side door. And here comes Brian Lynette running. <laughs> he grabbed me. He put his hand on my shoulder. He says, okay, you're the man wanted in Australia. God wants me to pay your ticket to Australia. I am your contact from Australia. What is your name? At that time, he had not even known my name. And he paid my way to Australia. And uh, I had the, the next problem was I still have my illegal passport. I got the ticket, I got the contact, illegal passport. I can't go. <laughs> it's like, okay, God, I got the, the ticket, I got the contact, but I, I can't leave. So I thought, well, maybe God's going to change the, the Australian consulate and give me a visa with my illegal passport. So I send my legal passport to the embassy in Pretoria, South Africa, to, to give me the visa. And he wrote back to me and says, under no circumstance will we ever give you a visa to Australia because you are a holder of an illegal passport <laughs> issued by an illegal government of Ian e. Smith. <laughs> it's like, there is no way we're going to do that. Then is, the last sentence was the, 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 the hope. He says, the only way it can happen is a special dispensation from the House of Lords. So I have sent your application to London to the House of Lords. Only the House of Lords can give you special dispensation to travel on a British passport. Wow. I still have a copy. Hey, Janet, do you have a copy of my British passport somewhere? <laughs> was it somewhere deep somewhere? Well, if you can find it, you can, I can show them. Anyway, it went to London. The House of Lords approved the special dispensation for me to travel to Australia on a British passport. That's how I got into Australia. All from the money, the contact, the passports in London, in the House of Lords, special dispensation. These are supernatural miracles of biblical proportion. Because I'm not, I don't look white. There's no way they could give me the, 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 the passport because I don't have, I didn't have any relationship to the British government. But God, but God, our God, a miracle working God. And um, when I got to Australia, I met my, my friend was waiting for me. And I'm going to jump over. I went to college there in Australia because, you know, I had this idea that holy women go to Bible college to learn about God, to be missionaries. So I'm going to find a holy woman at the college. So that's the place to go. They're all there, and she'll be one of them. So i like, I got it, God. Just don't worry about it. I'll, I'll handle it from now on. <laughs> I will take care of it now. 
you know, and uh, I, uh, I, I, I'm so amazed at how God has mercy on us. So for, for two years, I'm looking, this one, or is this one, or is this one, and God is like, no, my son, I didn't tell you that. No, I didn't tell you that. So I am about to graduate from college, and still I haven't met the woman. And I'm getting desperate. I'm like, God, where, quick, where is that woman? I, just, I, I, I don't know. You know, I can't find it. Okay, God, you know the problem that these white people all look white. So I don't, I don't know which one. That has certain division. So, so you, you got to pinpoint which one it is. So the Lord spoke to me. He said, <laughs> it's amazing. He didn't, he didn't address the issue of the, of, the, uh, of the woman I was praying about. He spoke to me and said, seven o'clock in the morning, we were on vacation from college and the, the angel of the Lord was at the, at the end of my bed and he spoke to me. He said, I want you to go to the hospital to Long Sustain General Hospital and see this man that you met one evening on your way to college because I'm gonna call him home at 9.30 tonight. And I want you to go and tell his wife. Wow. <laughs> now, what is to understand something? I'm in Australia and I'm with this family from London. Um, and I, I get, we, everything has to be on time, like, you know, the British culture, uh, breakfast, everybody has got to be there dressed up and proper, and, you know. So I'm like, oh, I'm running late. I'm tired of all the exams and stuff like that. I gotta go. I, okay, I get up, I jump in the shower, and I'm still thinking about what the Lord told me. And when I sat down, my lady said to me, uh, is this something on her heart? I said, yes, before I thought about it. The Lord just spoke to me, an angel of the Lord just spoke to me. She's like, angel of the Lord in my house? <laughs> and you are from the seminary? You have fallen off your tree. You are crazy. <laughs> so what did he say? I said, for me to go and see this family in the hospital. And he told me the name of the hospital was Long Sustain General Hospital. And he said that the man that I met one evening will be there. He says, Garth McCulloch was his name. And she said, do you know that I'm a sister at that hospital? I said, no, I didn't know that. This is no problem. After breakfast, I'll take you there. Before we got there, she already called the, uh, we, uh, we called it the Sanhedrin. The <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 head, the head of the seminary and the board <laughs> that one of your kids is going caca <laughs> so she already informed them and by the time we got there you know, she's like what, how could this seminary have such a crazy people <laughs> anyway we got there she ran straight to the information do we have a Garth McCulloch here and they got on the computer and looked and says, yes, fourth floor. This is the room. She looks at me and we go up and Garth McCulloch had an open heart surgery. He was wide awake. His color had returned and the doctor just told him, you are leaving on Monday. And this was Saturday. Oh dear. And, <laughs> and they were so thankful, a successful operation. He is good. And he grabbed my hand it says, all I prayed for was that I would meet you again. The night you spent with us was the greatest night. This was his only request to God, that he would meet me again. So this was, had nothing to do with me. It was the, the faith of this man that one more time, wherever Robert is, I want to meet him again. I, wanna, I want him to come. I want him to pray with me. I want that to be the last thing I do is to see this man again. Because that night was a great night. It changed my life. So that's why God had me go there. So 
the, uh, I told the wife, she got mad, that this man, that the doctor says he's leaving on Monday, and he's leaving tonight. The angel that spoke to me had come to take him up. He was going to take him at 9.30. So she's like, so this, she reads the medical report, his heart's good, everything is good. And she's like, he says he's going to leave at 9.30. I don't believe so. So she calls the church I was, I was, I was, I was ministering. And all the faculty members from the seminary all on standby for 9.30. This was going to be the Armageddon. <laughs> this was going to be the, <laughs> the biggest crisis in the, in the country. And so uh, the they, they pastor says, you're coming to dinner with us. And when I got there, the head of the board is there, the seminary and all the trustees. And, oh, it's like, whoa, what a night. It's all about what you say. This man was going to be taken at 9.30. How do you know that? Anyway, they already arranged the hospital to call. So 9.40, the phone rang. The hospital said, Garth McCulloch has just passed away at 9.30. Wow. Then they said, okay, okay, Robert, you've come to show us another dimension that we don't have here in the West. You've come to demonstrate the, the nowness of God and the supernatural that we, we have lost. We want you to have a citywide meeting where you pray for the sick and show them how God still answers prayer because this miracle is a miracle of biblical proportion, which they've not seen before. <laughs> So, so that it became wonderful. And to jump over to Janet, six months after, when I was at the funeral, the, uh, the man from South Australia, whose daughter was married into that family, got hold of my hand. He says, I quit going to church because everything I read in the Bible, I don't see a church. Today, for the first time, I've seen what I read in the Bible. So if you ever come to South Australia, come to our home. Here is my card, come to my home. So I took that card and put it in my Bible and forgot about the man. And six months later, I'm praying about the, the woman. God says, the man that gave you the card in his home, you're gonna meet this girl. I'm like, God, I don't know where the card is. <laughs> I probably lost the card. God said, no, no. In that drawer, it, actually in that Bible you, of yours that you're not using, it is in there. <laughs> and I opened it, and there was the card. So I called them. I said, can I come and visit? They said, well, it's your pleasure. Come. So here is how religious people can be hindrance to what God says. Because of the miracle of what happened, the, the, the trustees and the faculty arranged for me to have another big meeting in Harvard, the capital of the state of Tasmania. And I tell them, no, I'm going to South Australia. They say, wait, wait a minute, you can't do that. We are the, the Sanhedrin. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't let you, you can't do that. I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. Well, you know, religious people are incredible. So they told all the students, don't support him. All the churches, don't invite him. He is a rebel. He is a rebel. So they shut down everything and... It's terrible. We were closing the, 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 the college and everybody had to leave in winter in the South Pole, near the South Pole. And I had no way to go because they told everybody, every house, every family not to take me mm -hmm. because I was a rebel. <clears throat> and they locked down the dormitories. 
Wow. So I had no way to go because I was, re I was a rebel. That's what religious people can do. Yeah. They are mean and ugly. I was trying to be faithful to God, and furthermore, he told me I would meet the woman that he showed me. Well, are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, I'm young. I'm, I'm ready. I'm like, God, oh, glory. Now, now yes, the, the problem is I have nowhere to go. We're outside. All the people are leaving the domes. The, 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 the cars are driving out. The young people are flying out to all over the world. And I'm the one with nowhere to go. I can't stay there. There's no family that will receive me because the college said I'm a rebel. I, will, I have to live in the, under the bridge in 20 degrees below. And they were willing to do that. At the last moment, the last, last, as the last car was about to leave, they called me, paged my name, Robert Mawiri. I went to the, to, 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 to the front, to the secretary, and she hands me this envelope. I say, who gave me that? She says, we don't know. Somebody we have never seen here. The angel from heaven, a person they'd never seen before, handed them the envelope with the exact amount of money for me to fly out from Tasmania to South Australia. <laughs> so I stopped the last guy who was leaving the, the seminary and said, are you going to the airport? He says, I'm going to New Zealand. So you want a, a ride to the airport to come with me? So I got a ride with him to the airport and got on the plane. And while on the plane, I'm thinking, well, I'm going to South Australia. I don't remember the face of that man. <laughs> And furthermore, they're all white. And I met him in the crowd of many other white people. So I'm shaking hands and I didn't take notice of him. He's cut off his hair or anything. And I'm thinking, oh no, how am I gonna find out the, the family? Then it dawned on my mind. I am the only black, <laughs> they'll come to me. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. They came to me, they were so happy. They took me to the, to, to the house. I mean, it was like uh, Father Christmas. I mean, it was Father Christmas. It was, it was incredible. As a matter of fact, the man became an elder at the Assembly of God in, in, in Adelaide from that day. He went back to church, got stronger than ever. He, he became an elder. So God was doing something marvelous. Anyway, in that home, I met Janet, just like the Lord said. And I told her, I'm gonna marry you. And she ran to her pastor and told her pastor, there's this guy, she's gonna marry me after two hours of dinner. And I don't know the guy, never heard him, never seen him before. And furthermore, he is black. And the pastor said, Janet, she is a false prophet. He's a sheep in, uh, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> I want to write a letter to him, so sit down and type this letter. Never again call Janet. If you ever call her, we'll have you not graduate. We'll have you deported out of the country. Never ever do call her ever. And Janet calls me, she says, don't even think you met me, forget it. You forget it. <laughs> My pastor said no. I went home and told my mom and dad. And my dad got mad and said no. So my church says no. My, pastor's, my, 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 my parents says no. So there is no way this is going to happen. So just forget it. And don't ever call me. Never write me again. So I, just, I said, okay, God, this is a good shepherd watching over his, his flock, a good parent. There's nothing much I can do. I did what I believed you told me. Um, I graduated because I didn't want to do anything because they were not going to graduate me and throw me out. <laughs> so after I graduated, I got an invitation to preach at the largest church in Adelaide, South Australia. And Janet's friend was at that church. So she is looking at the bulletin and says, is this the guy you're talking about that's going to preach at our church? 
He said, yeah, yeah, that's the one. He says, we don't be my guest. Can't come and hear him preach. So she came, I didn't invite her. She came with, with, with her friend, Myra. And so they came and Myra said, hey, do you want to have lunch with, with us? It's not your initiative, it's me. Come have lunch with us tomorrow. So I went and had lunch with them and told them I was coming to America. I was going to America now. My work in Australia is finished and God told me I'm to go to America. So I'm on my way to America. And uh, she said, I'm, going, I'm coming to America. I said, you coming to America? She says, well, you can come see me in Fort Worth. She says, well, we're going with the, uh, with the whole, the elders and the team of us, and we're going to, to tour together and you know, there's no way I can break away from, uh, from the group. And if we have this scheduled, everything is scheduled. We've been planning this and it's, there's no place, we are not even coming to Texas. So we're not coming to Texas. I say, well, if the Lord wants you to marry me, you will come to Texas. She said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not in charge of the program. When they were in Virginia, the head of the group said, you know what? I have three days for you to do nothing and I want us to go to Texas, to Fort Worth, to Dallas Fort Worth, exactly where I was. <laughs> and he says, you all can do whatever you want. So I was able to invite Janet to see my, to meet with my, my, my brother-in-law and my sister and uh, say, look, if this is of God, we all agree. Your church must agree. They must hear from God. Your parents must agree. They must hear from God. If that doesn't happen, God does not want it to happen. It's not of him. And we were happy with that. So we said, this is how we're going to know God is in it. It's when your pastor hears it and gives you the blessing. The guy that wrote me a letter that I'm a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. That same guy, if he, he hears from God and say, I'm the man that God wants you to marry, he will tell you. And your father who loves you will also hear from God and he will tell you. Then we will know that it is God. That will be confirmation. And took a year. At Christmas, the, the pastor said, Janet, I have a word from the Lord. You remember you told me about some guy that you had met and I wrote him a letter that he was a wolf in sheep's clothing? God has spoken to me that that is the man that God wants you to marry. And I, here is a letter of apology to take to him because that was wrong. I give you my blessing and the blessing of this church to go and marry that man because he was sent by God. She's like, whoa. <laughs> that was just before Christmas. And she was like, wow. So she goes to Christmas that weekend to be with her family at Christmas. And her father says, you remember you told me about some guy that got married two years ago? God has spoken to me that you must marry that man. And here is a check of $40,000 for you to take to him. Call him and tell him that you have the blessings of your parents because God has told me he is the one that he wants you to marry. And she called me and said, you can't believe what happened. <laughs> My pastor writes a letter of apology. My parents gives you $40,000 and say, God, wants you to marry me, she never brought it up with them. She never brought it up with the pastor. She never brought it up with their parents. It was, nobody ever talked about me ever again until that meeting. And that was a confirmation. And uh, we got married 40 years ago, July the, the 12th, which is coming up, which is our 40th anniversary. Three boys, six grandkids, most blessed. Blessed, I mean blessed beyond measure. God gave me the most wonderful wife, the most wonderful kids, the most wonderful life. When you trust in him, Amen. he never fails you.
So I think I, 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 I quit at this point. Until next time, I'll share about the other miracles and prophetic words and prophetic destinies of nations um, that God has given me and the call to prepare his church for such a time as this. Amen. In closing, I want to say this, that the key to walking with God and hearing God is holiness with happiness. Not legalism, but true holiness that comes through abiding in him. When you abide in him, you will hear his voice. My sheep hears my voice, and the other they will not hear. And it's a still small voice that guides us. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord, ordered of the Lord, step by step, day by day. Uh, supernatural provisions. How did I come to Texas? I was, I wanted to live in Melbourne, Australia. And I'm praying, so excited that I was going to be near Janet. Maybe things will change in the future. And I was praying with this old lady, 80 years of age. And she started, when we were praying, she started drawing. And uh, she drew the flag of America and the Lone Star flag of Texas. And it says, the Lord wants you not in Melbourne. Because I was just praying about it. But the, the Lord wants you to go to the Lone Star State in America. And when she said that, that was 10 o'clock. At 2 o'clock, my friend, that paid my way from, from Rhodesia. Called me up, he says, Robert, at 10 o'clock, God spoke to me that he wants you in America. I've already put in my your ticket on my credit card. So just go to the airport, your, credit card, your, your ticket is waiting for you. His will, his bill. You, you never have to do things for God. Let God be God. Allow the Holy Spirit, the peace of God, the joy of the Lord, that inner guidance that comes through intimacy with God. That's the key for these last days. That's what we're going to use in these crisis times we're living in. We're going to walk in the spirit. We're going to hear the Lord. He's going to guide us. He's going to provide for us. And it's going to be ever increasing supernatural manifestations, miracles, signs, wonders, provisions. It's Amazing how God has everything already prepared. Before we pray, he is already answered. So now, may I bless everybody? Wow, yes. <laughs> we receive, we think. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Prophet Robert. It was so inspiring. Yes. And I just wanted to quote again Revelation 19.10, that when you testify the miracles of God in your life. It is the spirit of prophecy into all our lives. So thank you. Amen. I appreciate Amen. The prayer, a prayer or impartation to us. Amen. 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 All Amen. of us will know it. Yeah. Yeah. That we will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we will walk in the supernatural, just like. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Father. Father God, I thank you for your children. Right now, my father, they are saying, we want more of you. Amen. More anointing. Amen. More joy. More peace. More love. More miracles. More signs and wonders. Father, they are living in a place where they need to see your hand in the land of the living. Now, I release that faith in them, Father. Because all things are possible to them that believe. All Amen. things are possible to them that believe. Father, May they rise up inside of them and say, I believe, I believe, Father, for my miracle, my financial my miracle, miracle, my relational miracle, whatever miracle they need, the healing miracle, whatever it is, Father, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be glorified in their lives. Anoint them with fresh oil, the oil of joy, the oil of joy, blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, cover them 
Cover them, Lord. Cover them with the blood. Cover them with the blood, Father. Because now evil can penetrate the blood. So, Father, cover them with the blood. The blood of covenant. The blood of, the blood of reconciliation. That blood of cleansing. Cover them now from this moment, Father. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you for the people that were listening. May you bless each one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much. We receive You're every welcome. word that you impart to us. And everyone listening in, take it in. Take Amen. It in and start to walk in the miraculous, the supernatural. Because you are the forerunner. You are the forerunner. We are just yeah. hearing and say, what is written in the Bible is true. And it, whatever thing God has done in the past, he'll do it again Amen. to all of us. Amen. And Many people Amen. that come into Amen. the kingdom will similarly walk in that dimension. Then the world will Amen. know God is alive. Amen. The faith of faith of Amen. God to bring out the miraculous. God <laughs> is the one that works. Woo! Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got it. You got it. You got it. Praise the Lord. Praise Thank, the you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'll, I'll, I, in, the, in the future, I will share more on the side of the prophetic to the nations, to the heads of nations. Um, and then, uh, you know, let's hope we will have another one where we can talk about that. Thank you. Next week. You're welcome. Oh, wow. So just an uh, announcement. Uh, next week, uh, Prophet Robert will be sharing about the mark of the beast uh, with the church, uh, every nation church, all nation church, uh, Pastor Noel. Uh, 8.30, you can zoom in, and when Pastor Noel give us the ID and the password, I will send it to you all while, uh, through the WhatsApp. And so be ready next week, uh, Saturday at 8.30 in the morning. Come and uh, listen to uh, Prophet Robert, who is going to share with us the mark of the beast. Yes. Just all right. May I say this before I go? Uh, please give the people the, the, uh, the way, way they can get to the Robert Mawiri Men of God. So they can get all the details because there's a lot <laughs> yes, of details. Yes. <laughs> and okay, we'll send them get... the link. To... Yeah, okay. right. <laughs> and Prophet, we want to want to catch hold of you. Do not let you go after the session for next week. We want you to resume with us because uh, you you have arranged with Pastor Noel. So next week is uh, Pastor Noel's topic. But after that, um, like. We discussed uh, sometime last week. God has laid in your heart certain topics to teach, to disciple the people. So uh, we will continue after next week with you. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I like you and the person in the world to coordinate together because it just helps me so that I don't have to speak to, to uh, Malaysia and to you. It's always wonderful when we can be together. Yeah. Doing life together is wonderful. Absolutely, yes. yes. But we it's want the unity the of the body. So yes, we, we will work together. You, yeah, you, you all do that. You, you <laughs> I love you guys. Bye.